an in, uh, there was an article that I read that a state had been sanctioned by the ICJ, but this is not, but this was an economic sanction, parang meron silang binayaran. I forgot, basta something to that effect. Um, and then with the ICC naman, I think um, if you can, uh, it's, I think maybe most, uh, some of you would know na meron nga mga tinatry na mga dun sa International Criminal Court of Yugoslavia, of Rwanda, and there have been people who have been uh, convicted for for genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity under the ICC jurisdiction. Any more questions? Actually, the state is not allowed to do that because the neutral party should be able... Yun nga yung pinaka-important for the Red Cross, eh. The Red Cross, ang, in, ang credibility niya to enforce the IHL comes from the fact na it's neutral, cannot be influenced by anyone, it cannot be directed by any party. So, um, which makes sense because if you're the neutral party, and then merong, uh, for example, Party A and Party B. If nalaman ni Party B na pwede ka palang i-influence ni Party A, pa bakit ko igagalang yung IHL? Why would I respect the IHL when you yourself, in fact, you're panic towards the other side pala? That's why the Red Cross is very, um, it, they're very strict na they should not be influenced and they should not be seen um, even seemingly influenced by any party during an armed conflict because their integrity and their credibility to enforce the IHL and to help both sides, whoever is sick, whoever is wounded, whichever side he or she belongs, the IHL will tend to that and the Red Cross will tend to that. So, kung nawala yung credibility na yun, yung integrity na yun, then the Red Cross becomes just another pawn in the in the uh, in the armed conflict. But of course, you know, in actuality, um, there are certain um, in actuality there are certain um, limitations the new Red Cross in enforcing their being neutral. Because, syempre, the Red Cross naman is not a military is not a military group, or they're not naman. Like for example, when you go inside a, um, a certain country and you're from the Red Cross, for example, this is, uh, for example, in Yemen. So, when you go there, hindi mo naman alam lahat ng terrains and lahat ng lugar dun eh. You also, you also um, sort of rely sa information that's given to you by party A or party B na nandito yung wounded namin, nandito yung sick namin, but it doesn't mean that you're influenced. It just means that you're also relying to the information given to you by both parties kung saan ka pupunta, huwag dyan kasi masyadong, masyadong delikado, or dito kayo dadaan to get to that area. These are limitations, but these are not to mean na you're influenced by one party. It, it just means that well, yun yan, medyo pasay siya because of what happened with the with the Mangindanao, but, you know, coordination with the parties on the ground, in actuality, of course, is very crucial talaga. And, for, for of course, for Red Cross most is especially because sila nga yung, ano eh, neutral party who want to tend to the wounded, wants to tend to the sick, and they have to be able to enjoy that protection na hindi sila i-attack pag pumunta sila sa kampo ng BIFF, for example, or ng MILF, for example. So, there. Any more questions? Yes. 
um, ganito kasi yan. Um, what do you mean, nagpupush sa, sa war na mangyari? Ah, so, ah, so you're saying, for example, si Pinoy at nagka-war, considered ba siya na civilian or um, armed person? Uh, actually, hmm, that's a very good question. Pero, um, in ano kasi, what we have, we have pag sa IHL problems namin, huwag muna tayo sa state, ha? Like, for example, sa armed groups yung pinaka-mastermind nila or commander-in-chief nila, regardless of may hawak siyang barrel or hindi, basta identified siya na siya yung commander-in-chief. He or she is an armed person. Or like, for example, nagbibigay siya ng speeches to incite the rebels to fight or to um, or to fight another armed group or the state, then that person is considered as an armed person hindi siya considered as a civilian. Pero, as to the, as to the, for example, the president being the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, I cannot answer it for sure, but in one of our problems, um, if you're the president and then you incite the people to commit to commit ha, to commit atrocities, for example, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, then you are considered as an armed person. Inciting ha, inciting lang. Like for example, you give speeches. If you're the president and you're just saying, "Okay, let's attack the other military camp." Within the IH, eh, parang wala ka namang sinasabi na patayin ang lahat systematically which is defined as genocide or war against uh, war crime or crime against humanity, then you're not considered as an armed person. But once you go overboard and then you say we kill them by ano, um, ano yun, gas poison or whatever or inutusan mo yung next in command sa'yo, kung ikaw si Pinoy sinabihan mo si Purisima na i-gas poison yung lahat ng mga tao na nandun sa Maguindanao, then you can be considered as an armed person. But for as long as your orders are within military, yung sinabi ko kanina na um, um, cornerstones of IHL, which are proportionality and discrimination and military goals, if it's within there, I don't think they can be considered as armed person. But once you go overboard, yun nga, when it becomes genocide, when you're inciting your commanders to to commit genocide or crimes against humanity or war crimes, then you can be considered, my thing is you can be considered as an armed person already. Any more understand and make them appreciate the benefits of um of um, international humanitarian law. So, um, again, um, we, uh, I discussed yung um, cornerstone principles of the IHL, which are proportionality and um, discrimination. Um, and, of course, um, actually, yung, yung proportionality, it's what I discussed kanina. It's also linked to the third one, which is, uh, as I said, um, it has to be geared towards military goal lang. You, you have to be able to, you have to be, the, which is the third principle, um, military goal. Um, yung military goal of each of the party has to be geared towards neutralizing the other party and not to inflict harm or damage against civilians and against non- um, non-military properties. Under the humanit uh, under the IHL, there's a protection for cultural and non-military properties. So, for example, um, di ba sa war in Iraq where there's, when there's sobrang daming mga artifacts that was lost during the war. It was looted, yung mga museums, 
um, got uh, were destroyed under IHL. Supposedly, these things could not become military targets. Hindi dapat maging military target yung mga museums na to, which house, which house the artifacts. But yun nga, um, because again, the IHL is not perfect, and sometimes nga, the, sadly, the states and the actors during armed conflicts do not necessarily um, comply with it. But under IHL, these are protected sites, these are protected properties, and there's a dedicated protocol or set of rules for it. So, if it's a non-military property, it shouldn't be a military target unless unless there are art groups that really house in that particular museum. For example, yung museum na yun, doon na talaga nagkukuta yung art group. So, that can be a military target. But the rule is to inflict as less less damage, uh, the least damage to be able to capture or to be able to neutralize the other party. Because the IHL Union wants to protect this cultural heritage and these cultural artifacts. Pero, um, so, with all these things, um, the downfall really, um, in conclusion, the downfall really of um, international humanitarian law is not so much because it lacks it lacks the parang the all the specific things that actors or state actors must do during armed conflict or during war but more more about the fact na during times of war um, integrity and compliance with the law is done away with by a lot of actors, by a lot of armed groups, or even by the state sometimes, um, or most of the time, the state and the armed groups do not necessarily conform to um, international humanitarian law. And most, especially nowadays, war, because of the very strict meaning, meaning of what war is, eh ngayon marami ng mga forms of act of war eh. Like for example, if it's a cyber attack and you get to destabilize the whole country under IHL, that's not an act of war. But in reality, and in terms of um, harm, ramifications to the country, you practically crippled the country for maybe half a day or Hours and the economic impact of that cyber attack, for instance, which crippled all systems of a country, is so much more than when you launched a bomb in a city or in a municipality, for an in, for instance. So these are limitations of the IHL that um, they they are well every and then every so often they try to come up with more relevant laws. But as of yet, because now of this growing um, concern and need to adapt to the to the development of technology, it has become difficult for of course for the states to to um, uh, forge laws not, that can keep up with the development of our technology. Because um, of course Coming up with treaties and coming up with laws takes a long time before you can finalize it and, and then you have it, you know, read by everyone, conformed to by everyone before it really gets passed. And then, wala na. It's not, no longer relevant anymore kasi parang 10 years na yung nag-pass. But, um, yun nga, but the very cornerstone principles of IHL, I believe, should be enough should be enough and should be uh, should satisfy the need for decency in times of war because these are universal concepts eh, of proportionality of discrimination and finally of military goal because these are these three principles are very universal in application you do not necessarily need to come up with us uh, 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 technical meaning 
or a defined sanction under the law before you can be you are able to conduct yourself um, and uh, conduct yourself properly or if ever there's a term uh, if ever there's a term no pro to conduct yourself properly in times of war but yun nga um, party states or, or state actors during times of war should be able to conform to these very basic um, principles of IHL so with that um, I end my um, lecture so any questions Um, so, for example, if you're a state party and you com conform to the Geneva Conventions or you conform to the to the um, IHL, there are defined um, ramifications under the Geneva Conventions. But the thing is, these um, these uh, are related to these are related to the ICC. Yung mga for example, genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. So yun yung mga, um, yun yung mga, um, yun yung mga atrocities that can be criminalized under the ICC. But in terms of how you conduct yourself as a state, or so, as well as a state lang actually, because because if you're an armed group and you commit certain atrocities, you will be under the ICC. But if you're a state, you can be under the ICC or the ICJ, the International Criminal, uh, the International Court of Justice, which is under the UN. You can be sanctioned by the UN. But the problem with the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, is you can only be um, within its jurisdiction with your consent. So, pag ayaw mo, if you are not, if you did not consent to their jurisdiction, hindi ka pwedeng isaction talaga ng ICJ. What could be done is not is not um, is not under the law, but I guess yun nga yung mga, like for example, what we debate most of the time, um, for example, these are uh, pressure from the sanctions in, ter uh, in the form of economic sanctions maybe, or um, you will be called out in the international press. But in terms of really sanctioning you as a state, the ICJ has a limited has limited power because the jurisdiction with the ICJ is based on the party's consent. So kung nag-consent ka, de, masaya. Pero if they want to sanction you and you, were, you are the state, why would you want them to... Why would you consent to the jurisdiction of the ICJ, right? But if you're the state, um, and then on the other hand, yung ICC, I was talking to you about the International Criminal Court naman, these are for individuals. So for example, you're the state, pero sa ICC, yung magiging under sa jurisdiction niya is the individual. For example, si General Purisima, for example, ang ha, <laughs> si General Purisima, siya yung mga under sa ICC because the ICC do not have jurisdiction over states. It has jurisdiction over individuals who commit atrocities. So, for example, yung commander ng um, Yugoslavian, Air, uh, Yugoslavian Army or yung mga, yung mga commanders ng armed groups, they can be brought to the jurisdiction of the ICC. And the ICC has jurisdiction when, um, when, the, when the national courts are unable to try the individual or they're unable because, for example, wala silang government or wala silang court or they're unwilling to try the individual. For example, if commander siya ng, ng state army, ayaw nilang i, ayaw nilang i um, prosecute. So, pwedeng sa ICC magkaroon na uh, itry yung individual na yun. So, these are two different uh, two different international courts that um, although mas maraming I, I do not know 
I think I read an article before when there was a um, sanction sa uh, with the ICG, but I cannot remember. Hindi siya hindi siya ano eh, hindi siya IHL related eh. Not IHL related, pero even when we were simulating uh, an, a scenario when Red Cross volunteers would go inside the camp and tend to the wounded and to the sick, before you can enter there, you have to, they have a verification process. You must be able to have your IDs and then they'll ask you certain um, confirmatory questions before you can enter. Um, prisoners do no kabila. So, more economical and more practical for the parties. Alright, so, so in that case, um, 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 humanitarian law, uh, international humanitarian law really makes up for, um, makes up for um, certain um, cornerstone standards of number one, proportionality. So what is proportionality? Under IHL, these are the cornerstone principles of IHL. Ah. Number one, proportionality is from the from the word proportion. You cannot use, for example, kung papatayin mo ang isang tao lang, you cannot use um, an, a weapon which will splinter to the other to other individuals within the area. So, for example, isang uh, this particular person you want to kill, hindi pwede yung gagamitin mo is yung meron yung bomb na parang may mga maliliit na how do you call this? Parang ma, parang strap. Hindi yata strap na yung tawag doon. Pero basta, pag pumutok siya, may bomb na pag pumutok siya, may mga maliliit na specks din na nag-disperse from it. Pellets. Pellets. Yeah. And there's a technical term for uh, There's a definite weapon na it's called eh, but I cannot recall it right now. So you can't use that kasi ito lang yung gusto mong i-attack or a certain person lang and then this weapon will cause deaths by the hundreds. So it has to be proportional or proportionate to whatever our, uh, whatever military goal you have. Whatever weapon or whatever mode of attack you use should be proportionate only to your military goal. If the military goal is just to, is just to, um, for example, there's a military base that you want to neutralize. If the military goal is that, you cannot bomb everyone, including the, including the surrounding community. Because your military goal mo is only the military base. Hindi pa yung yung weapon na yata attack more or ibabomb mo silang lahat, including the communities around the military base. Hindi pwede yun. It has to be proportional. And uh, it, has un it has to be proportionate to the military um, to the military goal that you want to achieve. And then second, you have to be discriminate. So IHL is very, very um, keen on protecting, um, very keen on protecting civilians. So, you have to be discriminate in your attack. Of course, you will say, ang hirap naman mag-discriminate. Eh, nag-war na nga tayo, tapos i-discriminate ko pa kung sino yung, sino yung civilian, sino yung um, armed group or armed person. Um, that's why, under the IHL, there are certain standards and there are certain symbols na... You, uh, you will be able to determine if a person is armed, a member of the armed group, or a civilian. For example, when a person may dadalang, may dala-dalang um, barel yung isang tao, that person is presumed to be, and this is within the IHL context, ha, na may war, my armed conflict, not during peacetime. Um, when a person has a gun and there's an armed conflict, there's a war, that person is considered as an armed person and you can attack that person if you're from the other party, of course. Um, but, kunyari, these are 
uh, parang clandestine na mga armed group and wala talaga silang dalang barel, under IHL, you cannot shoot that person. Of course, it, yun nga, um, sadly, parang you have um, IHL na is limited also and is um, geared towards na because the parang it's it's in favor of civilians eh. So you have so all all doubts if armed group ka ba, uh, if armed person ka ba or or civilian ka ba if my doubt it always spans towards the that person is a civilian. So for example, if kahit armed person ka pero wala kang dalang barel at the time that you are spotted or you are seen you are considered a civilian or the other party should consider you as a civilian and should not attack you. Meron din namang instances na meron mga neutral parties during war. Like for example, the Red Cross or if you're from parang, um, you're from, yeah, you're from the Red Cross, which actually the, for, they're the front runners in wanting to implement and to have the states really comply with the IHL laws and standards. So they have a symbol, so like the Red Cross, that's a symbol not to attack us, and the Red Crescent, and they also have now the Red, uh, Red Diamond, Diamond. Crystal, Red Crystal. So these are signs or symbols that people can wear, or um, neutral parties should, should wear if they are going to enter armed conflict areas during war time. So, although this can also be subject to abuse, ha, kasi syempre, if you're the other party, you can say, oh, magsusuot na rin ako ng red cross or red crescent or red crystal, so I can be considered as a neutral party and I'll be able to go into the camp of the other party to help their wounded, to help the sick there. So, um, you, um, of course, there are parang what the Red Cross or what these parties can do or are doing is that, of course, they monitor and they verify. Actually, when we were um, when we were doing moot court um, in San Sebastian, um, what the, the and we were acting as Red Cross volunteers. Uh, more than 10 already um, IHL laws that has been adopted by um, more than a hundred countries. Although nag-iiba-iba kasi with every treaty, you have to understand that with every treaty is a different is a different approval from each country, diba? So some countries will adhere to this treaty but not to this treaty and then some countries will would want um, exceptions to a certain treaty na hindi nila i-adapt tong provision na to, parang meron silang reservations as to their as to their acceptance of a certain treaty. So, um, so iba-iba. Uh, and with that, um, yung, yung, and isa pa pala, is yung IHL, it applies only during wartime. So, war, wartime or war is a, is a technical, as I said kanina, it's a technical, it's a technical term. Um, Number one, war is present when war is present when first there is an armed attack against one party. Yung um yung armed attack na to should have been systematic and this armed attack should have been definite to cause harm and great harm to that other party. And second, war is in place or war is present when it has already when it has been declared by the United Nations so these are these are technical meanings under the under uh, the Geneva conventions when war is present outside of that you cannot really say that there is war under its technical term so um, and hindi ka pwedeng as a state the only time that you can retaliate or you can um, bomb the other state, for example, or an armed group, unless there is 
war or an act of war. So, um, kunyari hindi nag-escalate to a level na para na systematic yung attack and definite yung attack to cause great harm to your citizens or to a certain group, then your resort really is to go to the United Nations and lobby for them to say, there's an act of war, let me retaliate. So what happens right now, for example, is that there is no, because of this very hazy and very um, technical meaning of the term war, um, um, mahirap for um, governments, like, hindi yung sa mga governments, for example, in Africa or in in certain parts of Africa na talagang may war that's going on um, or versus an armed group or for example what's happening in Yemen right now because uh, because nga of this technical meaning parang masyadong nalilimit yung application then of the IHL number one and also nalilimit din yung nalilimit din yung ano yung pwedeng gawin ng, ng state or a certain or a certain actor to that conflict because of the because of the technicalities of the law and parang mataas din kasi yung mataas din kasi yung standard before the of course before the con these countries will allow you to for example bomb a certain uh, camp full, full of armed rebels so in that uh, in that case since international humanitarian law only applies to armed conflict in times of war, and there's really an act of war, what what then applies during peacetime? So right now, it's peacetime sa atin, di ba? But what, what applies during peacetime is humanitarian law, human rights law, actually, human rights law, which is different from international humanitarian law, as I've said before. So anyway, yung human rights law naman, yun yung mga basic rights to live, to education, and to against um, against torture. Although, right against torture is also applicable in international humanitarian law. So merong mga, merong mga rights in human rights law that remains even when it's wartime. Like, yun nga, like the right against torture during peacetime, you have that right, and during wartime, you also have these certain kinds of uh, this kind of right against torture. Um, so, with that in mind, um, uh, let us now uh, proceed to the most common na mga criminalized under international humanitarian law. So, international humanitarian law, kasi it also defines certain crimes, um, and there are five crimes under common article, well, it's technical, no, but common article 3 to the additional uh, additional protocol 1 of the Geneva Conventions. So, number 1, that's genocide. And then number 2, there's crimes against humanity. Third, there's uh, war crimes. And then fourth, there's um, aggression. And, wait, kalimutan ko yung isa. Back to that. So, and these crimes are tried before the International Criminal Court, which sits in The Hague. Um, the International Criminal Court naman, it, kaso lang, from the five kasi, from the five kasi, tatlo lang yung hinihir ng International Criminal Court because of, because of the um, failure of the states to agree in, to, the, to the technicalities of um, only crimes against humanity, war crimes and genocide can be tried and are defined as uh, and defined for trial purposes before the ICC that's why even if the two other crimes are enumerated under the under the international uh, under the additional protocol one of the Geneva convention hindi siya tinatry sa International Criminal Court. It's just there. Kasi hindi pa siya nade-define. Um, what I can say as an example is, in for example, in law school, you have a law, it's already passed by the by Congress, but it has no 
it has no implementing rules and regulations. The, ganito kasi yan, in, laws, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the legal sense, just because you have a law, doesn't mean uh, apply mo na siya agad to the people. There has to be an implementing rule, there has to be an IRR, implementing rules and regulations, before you can apply it talaga sa mga tao. So, it's the same, it's parang it's the same analogy with this, with the other two crimes defined under under additional protocol one. May yung tatlo pa lang yung may IRR, which is the which are genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. So, but under, so yung dalawa, although it's there, you cannot, it's not actionable before the ICC or the International Criminal Court. Hindi mo pa siya pwedeng isu for, sir, for those other two crimes. So, um, so we already have um, um, more, the, the two most popular ICC courts, because ICC courts na kasi is, these are for those crimes done in armed conflicts during times of war. Um, we only, we all, we have the International Criminal Court for the, for Yugoslavia and for the atrocities in Rwanda. Those are the two. Although there are also other ICC courts, and these ICC courts, ano ha, um, it moves around, kumbaga, but it sits really in the head. So, okay, so, um, I won't go into the technical meaning of, um, I won't go into the technical meaning of all these curves because these are, this, this is very, um, these are very technical and, you know, um, in debates naman, we don't, sometimes we, uh, technicality parang hampers nga most of the time our creativity in coming up our, with arguments, but, um, Parang, uh, uh, I just like to go back to how are these how are these rudiments of law or sets of law actually um, develop? Um, most of these, kasi most of these or some of these are actually not humanitarian or to begin with. So, like for example, some of them are economical. Like for example, the the prohibition against poisoning wells because there's actually a law, uh, there's a Geneva Convention for that, an IHL for that na it was originally made in order to permit exploitation of conquered areas. So for example, if you're the other party, if you're the losing party and you sort of gave up already control of a, con of a, of a certain area, what you do is, syempre, you go to the source of water. So, ipo-poison mo yung, for example, well, or not just wells. For example, siguro pati yung may lakes done of what sort. And then you poison it. So, in that sense, it becomes useless for the winning state to um, exploit that area kasi masyado nang malayo yung pagkukunan niya ng resources. So, in that case, parang, you have to, parang nangyari was, you have to give due to where, to the winning party. Um, kasi nanalo naman ako, I should be able to exploit that area which I conquered. Pag ikaw naman ang nanalo, hindi ko naman ipapoison din yung wells or hindi ko naman din ipapoison yung lakes, etc. So, and then second, yung prohibition against killing prisoners um, were to safeguard the lives of future slaves or to facilitate exchange of prisoners. So before, uh, yun nga, it, one of the customary laws was um, hindi mo pwede, prisoners of war, for example, you can't kill them or you can't torture them. Before, the it wasn't really humanitarian, but more because the parties want to be able to exchange prisoners and they want they eventually would convert these prisoners to slaves or they want, would want them to become slaves for the other party um, or if ibabalik ba siya doon, then the, uh, ibabalik ba siya doon sa kung saan After your college years, um, it's really difficult to to juggle um, law school and uh, debating because law school is a very demanding, ang sabi nga nila, professors would always say that law school is a 
very jealous mistress or the study of law is a jealous mistress because um, you cannot pass or, hindi naman pass but you cannot uh, expect to pass your law school subjects when you're so um, when you're so distracted with debate well not so not naman with debate lang, but with any other thing. So, and it really requires a lot of reading and a lot of comprehension that you have to really devote most of your time studying in the library or whatever confine that you can find for studying. So, but it's easier when you have these tools that you get from debating, but it's not a sure way for you to succeed in law school or to pass all your subjects in law school because law school is a different it's a, di it's a different ballpark talaga compared to to debating but the, the things that you learn in debating will absolutely help you succeed in law school um, and also uh, finally parang ang gusto ko lang sabihin is in debate kasi parang I feel uh, per this is my personal take on it in debating you can be smart and not be studious or not be you know uh, you can be you can be just smart pero hindi ka magaling sa pag-aaral talaga hindi ka nagbabasa ng libro hindi ka updated sa mga things that you learn in school pero matalino ka madali mong magets madali mong madali kang makapag-hypothesize ng things but in law school you can't be just smart you have to be able to be uh, you have to study really, read all the cases, read all the books. You can't be just smart kasi the teachers will see through that. Your professors who are also lawyers will see through that. And the things that you will see uh, that they will require from you, you cannot hypothesize it. It's in, it's something that the Supreme Court said before or it's something that uh, criminal law has defined as a technical word, and you cannot, like for example, um, what Vic was saying kanina, libel, I, I mean, Jesus, I mean, libel, that's a technical term. In in debate, uh, in debate you can just parang throw that around like uh, parang hindi masyadong strict yung meaning ng libel, or hindi masyadong, or for example, war, hindi masyadong strict yung meaning ng war, but in law, War has a technical meaning. When does war happen? Um, when can you consider that that's already an act of war? That's something that's technical under the law. But in debate, that's something that you just throw around and people can just say, oh, that's an act of war. But there are defined enumeration what war is. So, so there. Um, and with that, um, any questions? <laughs> any questions? Uh, okay, so so anyway, um, actually, I'll start with the discussion on international humanitarian law. Actually, um, international law, um, this one, it's international law is different from international humanitarian law, and that's what I will be discussing. I mean, the latter, huh? Um, so. International law kasi, or public international law, it's um, a study of law which defines, uh, which is defined as the mechanism or a set of rules already defined how states and um, state actors um, deal with each other in terms of conflict or in terms of um, economics or in terms of diplomacy, that's public international law. But international humanitarian law is different. International humanitarian law, okay, okay, I thought it was a word. Anyway, okay, so international humanitarian law is actually something that's, again, as I said kanina, nga, because in in legal in the legal parlance it's technical nga. so in internet i'll try my best to to link it to debate and um, help you with 
help you with um, formulating certain standards or maybe formulating certain arguments relative to international humanitarian law debates. But I won't promise. Cause, yeah, um, anyway, so international humanitarian law, these are set of rules that are in place for parties who take part in armed conflicts. So, these are, armed conflicts again has a technical meaning. An armed conflict can be an international or a non-international armed conflict. So, an armed conflict, if it's international armed conflict, this is state versus state. So, for example, when eventually, um, a wine time of China and then so that's an international armed conflict, state versus state. And a non-international armed conflict naman is a, um, for example, in the Philippines, we have armed groups. And then there's a full-blown armed conflict between, uh, for example, right now, MILF or BIFF and the Philippine government. Or two armed groups within the state. For example, MILF versus BIFF. Then that's a non-international armed conflict. So, um, with that relevant information, um, maybe you would ask, oh, so is it an armed conflict yung nangyari sa Maguindanao? The, the incident where 44 SAF police officers died. Is that an armed conflict? No, it's not an armed conflict. Because it's an internal internal conflict of the state. Um, so, in that, because the Philippine government is not at war or in armed conflict with the with the BIFF or the MILF. In fact, they are into a peace agreement and make peace treaty. Na sila. We want to give them a Bangsamoro state or a Bangsamoro government. So, there's no armed conflict between the between the government and the MILF. The MILF and the BIFF um, naman, they're not warring against each other. In fact, what anong lumalabas dun sa investigation was that actually the BIFF and the MILF were parang they saw a common enemy with a policeman and then they shoot, uh, they, they shot um, these policemen and pursued them. So, wala rin armed conflict doon. Although, under IHL, medyo nagkaka... Uh, well, we'll get into that na lang later. But, so, in that case, so we have that cleared out na hindi armed conflict yung nangyari recently with the fallen 44, as they say. So, yun na ah. Uh, uh, so, it's an international or a non-international armed conflict. So, um, let's go with that in mind, with that general definition of what um, international humanitarian law is. So, let's go, to, let's go to the history of international humanitarian law. Um, international humanitarian law kasi developed from, it developed from uh, customary humanitarian law. So, as you know before, in the olden days, there are rudiments of war. How you conduct yourself during wartime is already uh, an accepted practice among um, warring state actors. So, for example, di ba before may uh, nakikita natin sa in the movies tungkol sa which is a, a an adaptation of what happened to, for example whatever war in the past, hindi sila kagaya today na parang, sige, subod na lang, or, you know, you, they resort to sneaky or um, uh, clandestine uh, operations against each other. Pupunta sila sa isang malaking field, parang meron sila, o oh, dito tayo maglalaban, ha? And then parang, o, oh, ikaw kung na, and then ako naman. Kung parang, and then mag-forward tayo ng five meters towards each other, and then ikaw muna, and then ako naman. So, and then, and meron silang provisions before, not set in stone provisions, but these are things that are accepted between the two, na when there are, ano, when there are people who get shot or nabarel, 
then I should be able, as as the one concerned, as the state concerned, I should be able to pull them out of the battlefield and tend to them. And you shouldn't, hindi mo dapat ako harangan. So, um, with that, do na develop yung, um, do na develop, and from there, do na develop yung international humanitarian law. Uh, it started with that, and then finally, somebody, um, with, uh, by the name of Henry Dunant, he called it, he wrote a letter and about the need to have these things written and institutionalized. And then, the, eventually, um, European countries, uh, it started there, kasi nga, the, actually, the, the, the pinaka mother, uh, mother law of international humanitarian law is the Geneva Conventions. So, the Geneva Conventions, it started with that, and then the, and then the, um, the, what you call this, the European countries came together and codified it as the Geneva Convention. And then, yun na, inadopt na siya ng maraming countries thereafter. So, right now, For that matter. we have, and then finally, um, finally, last is that um, what debate has contributed is that yung how it makes you understand better the things that you read and the things that you study. Um, in debate, kasi yun nga, when I was telling what I was telling you kanina na in debate, you, we are able to. We have to read a lot of things, a little about a lot of things. So, um, in that sense, we are able to um, understand better the things that we read and the, the inputs that we get from other people. Um, as a lawyer, for example, in the future, if you become one in the future, and as a law student. Because some of my law school friends or classmates would always say na parang hindi nila agad hindi nila agad ma magets they have to they have to run through the the explanation or they have to run through the through the case over and over again before they can understand it as debaters we're taught or we're trained na minsan di ba we have a prep time and we have um, limited number of days to prepare for a or limited num uh, limited time actually to prepare for any tournament with our with everything that's going on in our lives but we have to parang we are trained to be able to understand the things that we read sa isang basahan lang or at least you know not not too much time to understand it kasi I, to understand it I mean um, to read it over and over again before we understand it, because nga in in debate yun nga, we have we have scarcity of time and we need to be able to have all these things together to to understand it na agad because we do not we should already be presenting our case and speaking in front of the adjudicator. So in law school, for example you have to study and you have to be able to get those things that you read also with a limited number of time and with all the distractions around you so um and in in um in in the legal practice as well your bosses will ask you random questions or your clients will ask you random questions and you have to be able to give an answer not really know um everything or be too accurate about it or lahat na nakaspecify na dun sa answer mo but you have an idea you have a useful information to convey to the client or to your bosses or to your colleagues if it's a legal problem that you're discussing so in that in that sense when you're more coherent and you're able to understand everything that is that it is you're reading in a small in a in a limited time then you are able also to convey that message or to convey that under understanding um, better and in a more in a way that these people will be able to uh, uh, these people and yourself or the team as a whole will be able to solve whatever issue 
or case that you are trying to uh, that you are trying to uh, fix. So in that case, uh, and with all those things, um, I think those are the things that for me as a as a legal practitioner and as a law school before, these are the things that have helped me as a uh, that have helped me. Um, um, succeed in my legal practice and in my in my law school endeavor, and that's all. That's because I have been debating for like three years before I entered law school. And when I was in law school, I was still also here and there. Medyo na, I still double my feet on debating. But just uh, a ca caution for everybody who. Hello. Thanks, Victor. Um, hi, guys. I'm Tatin. Uh, that's what my friends call me, so you can also call me Tatin. I'm, but if you're confused, just call me Christine. Um, so, as Victor said, I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing law for almost two years now. Um, I'm an associate in Kapunan Garcia and Steel offices. And to tell you honestly, I haven't done debate for a very long time. Uh, my last debate was in uh, hardcore debate talaga was in when I was still in college and I graduated 2008 I graduated 2012 from law school and in law school there's really not so much about debate but more on moot court and moot court is very different from debate uh, moot court is more technical and hindi pwede ang 1000 words per minute sa moot court like how debaters usually are. It's the usual um, uh, comment of um, our professors and our advisors in moot court that debaters, uh, mooters, uh, debaters turned mooters in law school speak so fast that you can't really comprehend anything that they're saying. And in moot court, it's very important that you speak slowly and you make the judges understand what you mean. So, with that, so with that, um, I'll start with, um, as Victor said, I will be talking about international humanitarian law and how, well, worlds apart, no? IHL, international humanitarian law, and how debating can help you when eventually you want, if and when you eventually want to be, to enter law school and become a lawyer. Um, but so I'll start with the latter, para medyo light ng muna yung mood natin, di masyadong heavy from all the debate jargons that you've been talking about the whole day. Um, so I'll start with with how you know what the your practice as debaters in college can help you when you enter law school and eventually when you practice law, if you come to that and it, when you come to that, I mean. So um, first of all. Uh, very important. I think it's the, it's the, for me, it's the most important thing that debate contributed to my law school life and to my eventual practice of the law. Sorry, I don't have a, a PowerPoint presentation. I'll try my best to be as animated as possible. Um, so, um, first of all, uh, yun nga, yung pinaka important for me is number one, the confidence that debate gives you. When I started out debating, I was, um, hindi naman ako meek, no? I wasn't born meek, pero I was, I'm not sure of what I'm saying. I'm not, and it shows. Um, and actually, when I was a debater, I wasn't the, I wasn't the, the prodigy type. My debate career started very rocky. I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, I'm not the prodigy type. I, I earned my badge, my badges. So, um, I, it was one of the things that I initially liked about debating, how it boosts your confidence and it really, um, especially for example, in public speaking, not just in public speaking, but in writing, in how you handle conversations with other people, it's really different. So, um, it, and it shows when you talk to them and when you do your stuff eventually. So that's number one. Um, number two is thinking on your feet. Law school kasi is everyday recitation. So recitation as in, and 
some professors will not allow you to have your notes on your desk. So no notes on your desk and then there will be nothing that the professor will give you to give to help you remember anything. It's just a point blank question and it's either you get it or you don't. So thinking on your feet is very important in law school because it allows you to maneuver and hindi ka masyadong although siguro hindi mo kung kunyari hindi mo talaga nabasa or hindi mo talaga na pag-aralan this thinking on your feet, um, this thinking on your feet helps you not to, hindi ka masyadong mukhang tanga. Ganun yun, pag, pag nag-recitation ka. But of course, if you've read it, then you go, you you ace your recitation in, with flying colors. Ganun yun. So, and, um, you know, uh, I, 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 I've experienced in law school na wala talagang, hindi ka talaga makapagsalita or nauutal ka. But, there's, like, parang may naalala ka lang keyword, and then boom, you can al already answer the question of your teacher or of your professor. So, um, these are the things that we, uh, that debating in college helped me when uh, I was in law school. So, number three, also, um, reading. Um, in, in debate, we're taught na para you should know a little about everything not everything about everything. So, we learn, uh, we read something about, for example, the atrocities in Africa, we also have mga geopolitical stuff in Asia or in the US. So we know all these things and we try to apply arguments based on those contexts, different contexts. So, and so in law school, you really cannot do it without reading. It's all about, not even all about reading, but siguro, it's 50% reading. You have to read all these books and you can't, man, and you can't manufacture, parang, like for example, you cannot, uh, we, me and Vic were talking kanina, you cannot um, hypothesize so much in law school because it's all in the book. And you have to follow everything na nandun sa book. Parang konting-konting lang yung creativity mo because you have to be within the bounds of of the of, of your books and jurisprudence and what the Supreme Court said and etc. So, um, siguro ang pinaka-creative pinaka, pinaka -creative lang na part is when you explain it and when you, when you try to give examples because in debate, we're taught na you should start with a topic sentence and then you explain it and, and at the bottom of that is you give an example, diba? To make it more tangible and understandable to the adjudicator and to the people listening to you. So in law school, it also helps, it also helps that um, you're able to, to bring down to the ground yung mga nababasa nyo and those things will help you interact better with your teachers and explain it to them. In in ano naman, in in the law practice, when I what I've experienced is it's sobrang maliit lang na sometimes you have to present a case to a to a client. So you present the case to a client, you're more you're more understandable, or you're more they can comprehend you better because you are able to bring it to the most no, the most simple example or to the most simple um, to the most simple uh, what do you call it uh, words for them to understand because you, you must remember that these clients or for example your um, bosses or your professors um, sometimes they don't really want and they can't really appreciate any longer the legal terms so you have to make it more understandable to them. And as debaters, we are good at that because we are taught in debate to be as cohesive and to make the adjudicator uh, understand and appreciate your argument or your point. So, so next is, um, wait, uh, yes. Next is, you're able to ask questions. Um, Again, this is linked to how you as a debater can, as a debater, we are also, we sort of 
feel that we are sure of ourselves as you go along in your debate career, no? Um, in law school, kasi there are things that you have to ask really to your professors to be able to clarify certain things that you do not understand. And also, in, uh, in, in the legal practice, you must be able to determine the right questions to ask to your clients, for example, or to your bosses, for example. And in debate, we go down to the nitty-gritty of things and we really, um, and we really uh, point out which questions are the relevant ones to ask to be able to make a full circle of a certain of a certain case or of a certain legal problem. So in like for example in law school we are able to ask our professors or ask for example if there's a legal uh, there's a legal problem that you have to solve as a group maybe to be able to make the grade then you will be able to do that uh, better as a debater. And also in, in the law practice, you know, when you have meetings with your clients, uh, you, you have to convey to them and ask them kung ano talaga yung problem and we're more solution-based as debaters. Uh, me as a, as a debater before and now that I'm a lawyer, um, must we always ask the question, diba, na parang, how do we move forward from the problem? And in debate, that's a very basic question that we want to answer. So in law school and in the legal practice, that's also sort of a guiding star for you. Na parang when you talk to your bosses, when you're given a legal question or a legal problem, and when you talk to a client, your idea is always, how do you want to move forward with this? Or what's the intention? What do you really want to achieve at the end of the day? Because sometimes the client or your or whoever gets muddled up. The issues get muddled up, and the na yung how do you want to move forward? What's really the intention? How what's the end goal for everything? Or or given that that that's the that's your end goal, how do you want to do that? Parang you're more you're more uh, you're able to maneuver yourself better towards um, a more solution-based approach. Uh, unlike, you know, just coming up and throwing out all Can these... Can you consider Wala lang. It looks logical. But I'm telling you, it does, it's not logical. For example, a staffa. You can be in prison for a staffa for 10, 12 years. What's the logic behind that? The logic behind that, they would say, is this is the Draconian simplistic logic. The logic is, you need more years in prison if the crime was graver or was hard, was a harsh crime. Why? So that you will have more time to contemplate and to take your actions so that when you go out, you will be fully uh, sorry and you will not do it again. That's one. Second, deterrence. Parang, uh, pag murder, it's, very, it's a very grave crime. 40 years ang ibibigay sa'yo para you will not commit murder because you don't want to be in prison for 40 years, right? But the scientific, empirical, and rational uh, model has already proven in Norway and in Scandinavian countries that you don't need long number of years to tell people that what they did is wrong, right? You just need certain mechanisms like what? guided counseling, daily human interaction, proper incentives to make you realize that what you did was wrong and you yourself will internalize that and not do it in the future. Ano ba ginagawa sa Norway? Sa Norway, uh, ang maximum prison met lang doon parang 20 years. Baka mali pa nga ako, baka 12 years lang ha. There was, ano, Anders Breivik, killed like 40 people or 100 ba? I forgot. Sobrang daming tao. He was sentenced to maximum imprisonment sa kanila which was just like 12 to 20 years. Tayo 40, 30 years. Bakit sa kanila 12 to ano lang, ganun? Uh, they concede to the logic of status quo of, ba, of, of, the, of, of most legal jurisdictions in the world that more time would probably equate to more contemplation, more deterrence, more rehabilitation. But, they saw that 
when you inflict punishment for the sake of inflicting punishment, nagkakaroon ng barrier yung individual in accepting the reform. Because he feels it is unjust to punish him for something so long na 40 years, 50 years, patay ka na by the time you get out. Diba? Uh, Ini-internalize nila yun eh. And then, uh, second, ang ginagawa sa Norway, merong mga interaction with society. Anonymous na criminal ka. Criminal ka, diba? Nilagay ka sa prison. Yung prison mo is a community that does not have bars. It has uh, grass, it has horses, may internet. You can do what you want there, right? But the simulation of society that you're living in pales in comparison to actual society. And what they make you do is, you live there, but you can go to the real world. And they make you go to the real world. They make you have jobs in the real world. But no one in the real world, real world, huh, knows that you are a criminal. Only you know that you are a criminal. And so, ini-internalize mo, ini-reflect mo, this is, ano, I'm just explaining yung article na nabasa ko, tsaka yung model nila, kung bakit nag-work. Uh, ini-internalize mo, pag nasa real world ka, oh, I really want to live here, in this real world. Not in the simulated uh, pales in comparison world. Why would it pale in comparison? May internet, my horse, you can ride a horse. Because that is not the community that would have the people you would want to associate with. You would not have the careers, full careers, open careers that you can access in the real world. It will be just a, a, ano to? a shadow, right? Something that is like the person, but is not the person. Yun. So I'm already telling you what's the rational thing, but in the debates, you can still run the retribution, logically, possibly, but in the real world, the Norway model is a good model. Why is it a good model? Anong proof natin? Recidivism there is more or less non-existent. What is recidivism? The chance or the likelihood of a criminal who was released into society of repeating his offense or any other offense. Sa kanila, pag pinalabas mo si Anders Brevik after 12 years, there is just like 5% or 10% chance of him doing a criminal act again. Why? Because of their model. Because their model fully allows an individual to internalize what is right or wrong. It's a good model. Galing nila, no? Questions? 